and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the New Art School and Design the Dutch Podcast. Our guest today is Carol Vandenberg. Welcome, Carol. Thanks ever so much, Lefteris. I'm delighted to be here with you. Fantastic to have you here. So tell us about you and your work. Sure, let me maybe start off by sort of telling you how I, I got to the topic of design, and then after that, sort of the uh, design education topic, you know, as well. So I, uh, I started off life um, wanting to be a musician uh, and was intending to do that my whole uh, career. And then I saw what it was like to be at the, um, at the music school. And it turned out that most of that was sitting in a little practice room all day long. And I thought I didn't want to do that for, for four years. And so I uh, actually went into psychology and then went into clinical psychology for a while <clears throat> and then into cognitive science. And I was looking at affective and cognitive processing of information was my topic. And uh, I was doing a PhD at the time and actually put out uh, an advertisement for uh, research assistance uh, to the full campus. And surprisingly, I only got male applicants coming back. And I thought, well, I'm kind of a social scientist here. I should be looking into this. Now, this is a little more than three decades ago, right? So uh, at the time, there was a real gender difference in computer use. And there was a real almost phobia about uh, computers in uh, predominantly uh, uh, women versus men. And so uh, I thought that's weird. You know, uh, why should we be getting that again? And so I did a whole pile of other research there. We looked at a content analysis of advertising, looked at, you know, early uh, education. It turns out that boys were actually physically moving girls off of the computer in the classroom, that kind of thing. And then started down the path of how could you actually make computers more desirable and less, you know, stressful um, and less of a negative experience for people that, in particular, that were having a problem with it. So I did a bunch of work on changing the user interfaces of um, computer programs and also evaluated their, the effectiveness of these changes in the user interface in looking at self-report as well as psychophysiological measures as well. So things like blood pressure and galvanic skin response. And the changes that I introduced, and it was really more things that were focusing on the positive rather than the negative. So rather than lots of, you know, at the time there were lots of, you know, error messages and just, hey, you're doing things wrong kinds of feedback. And I switched around to really providing more positive uh, things and actually and also making the tasks easier so you wouldn't get error messages as, 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 as often. Anyway, all of that work led to some results that were pretty dramatic, actually. And so I presented those at a conference, and the press picked that up. And so there were all kinds of press articles and interviews and all that sort of thing uh, about this whole topic. And somebody from IBM uh, actually called me and said, have you ever thought of working for IBM? And I said, honestly, no. <laughs> I was really intending to be an academic uh, at the time. And uh, I thought, okay, well, I'll go for the interview. And uh, the salary sounded pretty good, actually. Uh, and the facilities they had were so much better than I had at the, at the university. So I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to give this a go for a year, right? That's now 33 years. <laughs> but and it was really, it, it was at a time when the IBM company was actually looking to um, break up. Uh, it was going to uh, not be one company anymore. It was going to be uh, in separate uh, companies all over. And it turns out that the I'm in Toronto, Canada. We had a lab, and we still do have a lab in a software lab uh, in Canada in Toronto. And the thinking at the time was that it was going to be on its own. And so uh, if we're going to be on, on our own, we really needed to make sure that we were actually developing products just amazingly well, and that would have all kinds of great design features. And we also determined that we needed a, an approach to creating products um, like a, a, an investment uh, model, uh, investment gates. So we actually created that. And I had read Don Norman's book on user-centered systems design. And so I took that. Um, and then I did a whole bunch of, of uh, 
one-on-one um, -on -one meetings with other companies in the in the industry. So uh, met with Microsoft and you know Oracle and a, a variety of other companies. And we said, look, we're not going to exchange confidential information, but we're just going to share experience on how could we make you know design better in our companies, right? And so all that led to a users IBM uh, user centered design approach. Um, that in the middle 90s, uh, we spread around the company. And that worked really, really well for the projects that we actually worked on. I also wrote a book uh, about our experiences back then. And the problem, though, was the only, we only had 230 designers for a company that had 400,000 employees. So we were kind of outnumbered, right? So we, were, we could only do selective work, but we had really su uh, great success on doing the Olympics, for example. We used to do those. Um, the uh, ThinkPad as a product went from like eighth in customer satisfaction to one uh, uh, in customer satisfaction. So anyway, those were the early uh, days and that's sort of my early time getting into uh, design. Fantastic, fantastic. So what what are you are you doing now? As in, in products? No, really good question. So it's, so we've done that for a long time, um, the <clears throat> user-centered design work and the like. And about eight years ago, um, we got a new CEO in the person of Ginny Rometty, uh, an amazing CEO, quite frankly, and also, also our first uh, woman as CEO. And she really gets design and really gets the need for design. And she also realized that the IBM company needed to pivot. And I use that word appropriately you know we talk about startups needing to pivot uh, when they're not quite hitting the the mark with regard to their fit for the market and that was the case for IBM there were a lot of markets that we were in that were dramatically changing you know uh, things that used to just be computer based were now mobile uh, things that were um, uh, the introduction of AI uh, which we were right at uh, in the first sort of uh, phase of with uh, some work that we did with the Watson, um, even the focus on, uh, on security uh, and uh, data analytics and the like as well, all those areas were dramatically changing. So we needed a, a method to be able to really transform the company. And so it turned out that we looked at a variety of the methods that were around uh, inside the company and outside the company. And it turns out that we had purchased a company some three years before that, Lombardi Software. And Lombardi Software was interesting in the sense that there wasn't any technology that they were bringing that we didn't already have. They just happened to really do design well. They used a version of design thinking that was applicable to all parts of the company. So it wasn't just the designers that using it. It was, it was the salespeople, it was the executive team. And the guy that ran that company is Phil Gilbert who also came with that acquisition. And uh, he's the guy that was behind that uh, overall approach. And so what we decided to do was the uh, was build a whole new organization that, that Phil and other guy, Charlie Hill and myself and a few others started to put together an approach of doing what our CEO asked us to do, which is to develop basically a culture of design and design thinking for the company and make it sustainable. So it's not just, you know, what's the process of the month, you know, um, it was really, how can we really build this so that it's sustainable? And so we put this whole new program together. It was uh, saying that we needed to hire a thousand, 2000, maybe designers, you know, beyond the 230 we had. We needed to have studios so that we weren't all sitting in cubicles, which was often the case back then. The fastest way to suck creativity and collaboration out of any designer is to put them in a cubicle, right? And so we built those studios and we've got close to 100 of those studios, but uh, most of the studios are, are uh, working the way we are right now. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about that later, but we're all remote uh, right now. Um, and then we also introduced basically this form of design thinking that we call enterprise design thinking, which is really an evolution of that overall approach that Phil introduced into that Lombardi uh, company that we that we purchased. And we also figured, okay, everybody in the company needs to go and do this. So we decided that we needed to have the, um, basically all the designers we were hiring 
we needed to, to uh, ensure that they knew that. And we also did sort of an assessment of what kind of skills designers that were coming from the top design schools, what kind of skills did they have and what kind of skills were they missing that we really needed to still you know, require for our work and things like multidisciplinary collaboration, things like having worked on real tough problems, uh, things like knowing design thinking and how to work with other disciplines using it and the like. And so we built basically a, a three month boot camp that we <clears throat> actually introduced and had every designer that we hired uh, went through a three month boot camp in Austin, Texas in the United States to really get skilled up in these areas. And you know what was interesting about that is that we also after that, when we asked it, the uh, uh, them what did they think of it, they were so impressed with the learning that they got. They they'd say things like, "Hey, you know, Carl, we used to do, you know, like a presentation based on our project work, maybe once or a week or once every two weeks, you know, when we're in school." But now you're asking us to do presentations every like two hours. You know, it's like this whole thing was like on 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 steroids. So we that was the designers. But then we also found out that we also needed to do the same thing with our engineers and our business hires. And so we realized that they also had those same you know gaps. So we started to 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 teach them as well. And then we also knew that we needed to change not just the people we were hiring, we needed to also change the people that were already at uh, the company. And so we had these um, educational experiences, one week educational experiences for product teams. So we'd have like two or three product teams come again to Austin, Texas, and about you know two design leaders, two uh, lead engineers, two business people together from, uh, from a project team. And they would take their project and product with them. And they would have the experience of like one uh, that I knew from, from a long time ago said, you know, I've been working on this product for 15 years. I've learned more in a 15 minute exercise using enterprise design thinking to get insight on the problems that we need to address uh, compared to all those 15 years of doing this. So, and then we went back to those people that were trained that way some numbers of months later and said, how's it going? And they say, you know what? It's great. Our team is just working so much better like this, but we have this one problem. And the problem is that our executives are asking us to do stuff that's out of line with this enterprise design thinking work we're talking about. So, you know, while we're trying to understand the problem and really know the user better in order to design a solution, they're actually asking for the high fidelity prototype instead, right? And so we figured we needed to train them as well. So we put an education program together for a one day uh, session for all of our executives. And that was basically our CEO and her direct reports, her C-suite, as well as all the, the executives in the company. Anyway, we did all of that and then put a whole uh, um, sort of governance system in place with all of that. And then got all our teams to the top teams to work on use these methods and get these uh, designers working on our lead products. And then also we have a large services organization, uh, basically a design agency that uh, works with clients directly. They also started to work this way. And that's, I introduced each of those organizations over in about a year each, uh, how to do this kind of uh, work. So we've been doing that the whole time, but it, it, what, what's interesting in terms of education is that um, I was, in England, in London, um, during, I think it was about 2015. And uh, the team there had been doing interviews with students from the design schools in, in England. I think they had about eight uh, that they interviewed during the day. And they said, hey, Carl, we need your advice. Problem is that we've interviewed these eight students um, and we had a very rigorous way of determining whether they meet a particular bar. And none of these eight met that bar, right? What should we do? And they said, you know, we've got like two or three head count. It was toward the end of the year. They were worried they were going to lose their head count if they didn't hire somebody. And I said, no, no, I'll, I'll keep, or should we lower our bar and then hire somebody anywhere? Or should we keep the bar, bar high and not hire anybody this time around? And, and I said, I'd, I'd help them keep their head count and that they should keep the bar high. Um, shortly after that, I talked to the president of the, the UK Design Council, and the, right after that, had an interview with the press again. <laughs> and I told this story to the press, and they put a, 
a headline to the effect of, you know, uh, IBM designer bashes uh, uh, UK design schools for, you know, uh, insufficiently uh, educating design. It was it was quite a, a negative uh, headline. It was actually an overstatement of what I was saying, but that led to a lot of questions from design schools saying, "What are we What are we missing?" And then I started working with them. And then when I went back to Toronto, I actually started to work with a local university here. Um, I became an industry professor there and had been prototyping basically, you know, uh, curricula and courses uh, there that are, were, were very successful. They're still going. And uh, so that was my sort of uh, experience with, with education. So you're, you're, you're preempting my next question. You, when did you, how did you get into education? You, you went started in Toronto. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. So I started to, to, to teach uh, and I've done that sort of five or six years now um, Developed a, a pan-university, multidisciplinary uh, uh, course, working on real problems like capstone projects with with you know industry and government and that kind of thing. Um, I developed a uh, uh, the design part uh, and the design thinking part of a an executive MBA program, a digital uh, uh, MBA program. Uh, a medical school program as well for for emerging health leaders. Uh, we put a design uh, program, you know, in there, as well as for there's a director's college, which is education for for boards of directors. Um, and my it's my supposition that um, directors of boards that govern companies and organizations also need to have this kind of mindset, this this de design aesthetic, this design sensibility, if you will. And uh, so we teach that, you know, course as well. Fantastic. It's very interesting you say 2015, because that's when I started my research. Having seen a lot of this disconnect, I've been teaching this since 2009. Um, so this disconnect between um, students uh, universities and industry. So is that I've been I've been so sort of one of the one of the reasons this podcast came came along is it because of that disconnect is to have those conversations. Uh, oh, I love that. I love that because these three stakeholders are very rarely talking to each other, and especially when uh, universities and having done the research, uh, having done a kind of global research since then, there are uh, country specific issues. Mm -hmm. mentioned the UK is very interesting. Um, when people are going, just going through the motions and eventually uh, industry is being pushed out. Yes, yes. Uh, well, they, they all have their own own sort of uh, uh, objective. And, and it's actually, it's, it's, it's on various levels. I, I'm glad you raised this, Lev Terrace, that, that it's education itself, you know, is, is it the case that students are being educated appropriately for the ones that are actually going to be going into like industry and, and, and government and the like? Um, are they being educated appropriately? That's one element. The other one is actually the, the design research that gets done. The, the academic research uh, in the field that is expected to contribute to the way we do practice of a design. And that too, to your point, is a disconnect uh, as well, right? I, I think that there's a uh, there's a, a study that I that I looked at. I, I actually blogged. I, I have a blog at carlvredenberg.com, and uh, I went to the Paris Chi conference and uh, was surprised by how little uh, applicability there was at the Chi conference to to practice, right? To, to actually uh, um, useful, you know, uh, research that would have an impact directly on the way that you do design uh, in, in, in the world. And there was one study, it was a short paper um, that I thought was really interesting and in that it looked at wherever the, wherever the CHI conference was before, the, pri the prior four years. And they looked at all the papers that were at that conference and determined there, that there was something like seven or nine percent uh, of them that were that professed to have an impact on or be relevant to the actual practice of, of yeah. design and they took those ones and then actually got practitioners to evaluate you know whether that it, it, the information in those uh, studies was actually useful to to, to design uh, practice and that I, I blogged about it saying it's really kind of a sorry state that we're not you know getting uh, more research that would directly apply to the practice of of, uh, of design. And I actually uh, uh, did a session with academics and industry uh, with IBM. Um, 
after that, where it pulled together, I think, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood about 10 uh, academics uh, and 10 uh, uh, industry people and said, let's change the way that we do our work. And the way that we do our work today is typically, you know, acad an act academic might come to industry just for funding. They, they want their next study funded, you know, in the a series of studies they want to do, right? And what is what is industry often want? They want you know some cheap laborers. They want some graduate student to do some work or whatever. I'm just I'm, I'm overstating it, but that that's sort of the way that we're coming in. But we're not oftentimes not collaboratively working on a an interesting problem that we both feel uh, is has 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 applicability to industry, but also an, is an interesting challenge for for academia to contribute to the body of knowledge. And what was interesting was. We started down the path of identifying what some of those things were. And what was interesting about it was that we started to do some studies that were really, really effective, really high citation counts, because everybody now saw the relevance of it. I did one study together with some uh, uh, researchers at the University of Waterloo that looked at user-centered design practice at the time and looked at of all the, the methods that were being proposed, how many were actually being used, right? And we basically got, the, got designers to say, what do you think are the most powerful methods? And then what methods do you actually use? And, th and there's huge difference in the two, right? Um, with essentially the, the finding being that everybody was using the quick and dirty stuff that uh, they knew wasn't the most powerful, but yet the people that were hiring them were expecting that they were actually using the most powerful methods that designers had, right? So this real disconnect. So then we started to look at, okay, how could we improve that? And I think, you know, design thinking, enterprise, enterprise design thinking, our version at least, has, I think, all the ingredients to address some of those same problems, right? So we would have instances in the past where, during the time we did user-centered design where we'd do like a tax, task analysis. And we'd write this great big report and we'd send it to the, to, to the product team and nobody would read it, you know? Uh, and now instead we, we go do, you know, some lighter weight um, ethnographic observation, let's say, so, or some co-design with, with, with our users. And what do we do now? Now we can collaboratively really quickly actually capture the insights from that in empathy maps and as is scenario ma maps, for example, where everybody's creating it, it's all readily consumable um, and it's always there as a record as opposed to writing you know, lots of uh, documents and like. And so, so I think that there's huge opportunity and I would ask you know, all your listeners to reach out. If you're in, if you're in industry, reach out to an academic colleague and, and vice versa to identify things we can do together. Well, it's incredible you're touching on all these issues simultaneously because I have, you know, I have these questions. But, but of course, you raised uh, the big elephant in the room, which is the values in the system of values, right? Uh, and that, and that, and that, that influences ev everything. And that's the least talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. The challenge in education we're having it comes from our come from the values that we've set. But the other thing is, of course, is that. Again, going back to the UK, is that there was a team of researchers at the Royal College that had established design as a third pillar of knowledge alongside right. humanities and science, and and that sort of has sort of is not very well known anymore because somehow that got sidetracked. So, we again from from an academic perspective and from a research perspective, we got to redefine how we look at design because right now in most in most uh, establishments, design has to go very very close to science, which is not always the case. You know, so right. it's good that we start giving some autonomy to to, to design in, in in its own its own right. Yeah, I think you're. Yeah, you know, there's a whole lot of things you just touched on that I just want to uh, drill down in. You know, one is sort of the overall values, and some of the time I don't think the values are so much different, but the way people are measured. You know, so in academia, you know, being measured on, you know, uh, on publications and there's certain types of work you would do that wouldn't even be recognized appropriately. Um, I often question academic journals and how many people are actually reading them. Uh, I, you know, colleagues and friends of, of the authors are reading them is, is, is my cynical uh, sort of assessment. Um, and, you know, and, and a lot of practitioners are not, you know, uh, uh, you know, consuming them. Well, is maybe the academic journal the right vehicle these days to be you know sharing you know this came from information you know <laughs> this podcast happened because 
the people that are doing design and are very busy solving design problems do not talk. The ones who are solving any problems and are just writing about solving problems don't talk and publish. So again, we have this yes. we have this dichotomy about the people that you know actually do are actually doing things. They got no time to talk. They got no time to write. They got no time to. They just they're just doing it, and they're in the in the in the doing mode. Uh, no, you're absolutely right, Lefteris, and I think it's also. I mean, it sounds a little bit like I'm dumping on, on on academic researchers, but the same problem with with the actual practitioners, as you say, they're very busy doing all of this stuff, but they're also not effectively um, communicating what challenges are that would be great, you know, research topics for an academic researcher to work on. So, for example, um, assessing the bias in a in a in a corpus of data for AI. You know that, that that's a fundamental challenge that we have right now, right? That's a whole area that 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 designers in practice, you know, have some real real challenge in trying to do that. And also, even things like right now, you know, we talk about the decolonization of, of design and that that we want to have other influences than the European and and, and North American sort of influence on design. Um, looking at sort of black culture, looking at indigenous uh, uh, teachings, there's a lot of information in there that we could leverage. Um, and if, but if it's up to entirely the the um, practice designers, the designers that are actually doing uh, work in companies and organizations, they got to figure all that out on their own. You know, here's another area that is an ideal space for you know academic. Uh, uh, design sort of researchers to to develop further um and i mean there are some uh, uh, uh dory tunstall uh, at, at uh, ocad university is doing some really nice work there on for example indigenous um learnings and teachings and how they apply to making our designs more sustainable uh there's some really good focus on that for example but i would like to say that there's a um I, I characterize it. So my brother is an academic and he often talks about that, you know, as an academic, he has more time to read widely and synthesize and, and, you know, have a, have a broader perspective on the field. Right. Whereas the, the practitioners in his, his field don't have that time, but can have the benefit of getting his broader sort of perspective. And I think we have to do the same thing in design. I think like this problem, these two problems that I've just I articulated, I think if we had people pull, pulling together really good frameworks for how to do these, even these two things that we just talked about, um, that would be hugely useful in improving not just design, but also sort of progressing these challenges that we see in the world uh, with doing that collaboratively together. But that probably also means that we shouldn't be just publishing the results in academic journals. You can still do that for your you know, promotions and the like within academia, but I think we need to also do what you're doing, Left Harris, and, to, and, and doing the, 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 the conference that you put, put on, these kinds of interviews that you're doing uh, with a podcast. That's a way of getting some of this information out there. I think we can't just leave it all in academic journals. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much for that. Uh, the thing is that uh, some institutions around the world uh, have been teaching swimming from a book. And, that, <laughs> and that's the problem, is that that's a very dangerous problem. If you teach swimming from a book and you get a PhD in, in, in swimming from a, reading books, and you go to the swimming, uh, to swim, and then something very unfortunate happens. So, and it's, and it's, <laughs> and it's, and it's the same with, with the practical aspect of design. Because, of course, you're also talking about design as an overarching uh, yes. philosophy, uh, elements of it. Are very practical and very practice based, and and that uh, in a lot of institutions around the world is missing. Mm -hmm. And wherever, according to my research, in some areas where it's not missing, uh, they hire people that uh, have not had too, too much uh, experience in the industry. So is that is that you know the practitioners that that, that uh, practitioner based education that we need to, you know, and and of course takes takes us to the next question about doing design education differently. And of course, you know, you you've said a lot of a lot of things already. Uh, is there something that you would like to 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 add on that topic? Yeah, yeah. Let me just address that. What <clears throat> about a year and a half ago? Uh, you know, I mentioned that I based the IBM uh, user centered design work on a on a book uh, by Don Norman, um, and I reconnected with Don, uh, well, I had a few times over my career, but about a year and a half ago, um, 
because I, I two years ago I put together a new program uh, at IBM uh, for academic programs. Uh, it was partly based on these uh, gaps that we saw and the conversations we started to have and some of the work that I did myself uh, in universities. And so we put together this whole global academic programs initiative, which involved choosing the top 10 design schools around the world, um, the top 10 uh, research universities that also had design, business, and engineering, and also in the United States, the historically black colleges and universities as well. And I signed a, an academic focal, one of our typically a, an alum or somebody that, that is a, one of our lead uh, designers to each of those schools. And we started to do collaborative work. And one of the schools that we were working with was um, University of California at San Diego. Uh, and the design lab there is the, uh, has had as its leader and its founder, uh, Don Norman. And so while we did some work there, we, we did uh, a really cool project actually with he and his students on uh, how to improve the lives of Parkinson's patients. Um, a really cool, you know, semester long um, effort. And while we're there judging the, the finals and the like, uh, he and I got talking about kind of the state of design education. And that led to a bunch of other, you know, conversations and, and some dinners. Um, and we then started an effort that's called the Future of Design Education Initiative. And you can go to futureofdesigneducation.org uh, to learn more about all of this. But we decided that there was enough of a, a challenge that our discipline needed to sort of ramp up on uh, that we really needed to have this huge effort. Uh, and the, so now we also have uh, a, a, I think 16 person steering committee uh, of people that are from academe as well as uh, people from industry and organizations. And we have more than 600 people that have volunteered to help uh, with this. Uh, everything from being a contributor to actually helping write new curricula, um, as well as review the material that's being done and also just keeping informed as well, with the majority actually wanting to, to, to contribute to this uh, as well. So we looked at, you know, and this is work that, um, uh, that Don had done uh, as well. He dug in deeper and looked at um, the whole notion of what have other disciplines done? So, uh, you know, law and business and computer science have all done kind of a major look at their discipline and put together guidance for curricula. Um, and then they revisit that every sort of five years or so. Well, design's never done that. And so our initiative is all about doing that, is to say, okay, look, let's get together, let's determine what kinds of things we need to address. So things like, for example, when I talked about the gaps in education that I, that I uh, that we identified at IBM, that's that's one of them that that says that a lot of schools are still teaching craft design, which is great. We do a great job at doing that. We continue to need to be doing that, but we need more than that, right? Um, designers are now, and, and the example that I'd like to give is sort of years ago, uh, I had a designer that. Um, that was amazing. And he came up with a bunch of uh, designs and put them on a, a whiteboard. And uh, the development team looked at all of it and they loved it. Uh, he came back the next week and said, you know, oh, I have a new idea. I want to, here's a new way to do that design, right? And he had almost a, 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 a revolt on his hands. He said, because the whole team loved the design, had implemented the whole thing, right? And that was just unheard of, I would say 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago even. Now we're at a mo moment where designers, at least in the majority, I, I, there may well have been powerful uh, design influences in certain types of uh, design, but I think across the board and certainly software uh, design now is a huge, huge uh, power base for designers. And so, and I'd like to say that you can be really positive with the impact that you're having. You can also be really negative and meaning that we've, I think caused, you know, a lot of problems that people have with even mental health in terms of, of being addicted, 
you know, to our devices. Well, that was designers doing an amazing job of actually getting people to really, really work with these things over time, right? Or, or social networks that, you know, the designers work really hard at, at getting people to just have their eyeballs on it all day long, right? Which is great, but it, it was destroying, you know, the, the lives and, and even societies and like the way that some of that went. Same thing with the, the, the hardware that we've designed as well, that are, it's causing all kinds of difficulty in terms of, of environment. Uh, and so I think there's, there's a, a need to broaden the perspective and look at the responsibility for a design. There's also the realization that designers now and design methods can solve problems and address challenges that are organizational level uh, challenges and even worldwide global uh, uh, issues as well. As, as a quickie example, um, I got together with the World Design Organization, Design for, uh, for America, and uh, uh, a whole bunch of designers from IBM at the beginning of the pandemic and said, you know what? I really I, I presented this as a, a challenge at a conference I presented at, uh, at last year that I think designers have the ability to not just spend their day the professional designers and, and academics for that matter, to do the work that they get paid to do. I think that we all have a moral responsibility to use our you know, amazing design talents and, and methods to help solve world problems. And so when you know, the pandemic came around, we put, put together this you know, COVID-19 design challenge and you can go to covid19designchallenge.org and, and read all about it. But we basically had you know, seven major uh, challenges that we solicited from our three communities and used design methods with about 300 designers from all around the world, 17 design uh, uh, time zones, working on using design methods to solve problems with regard to the pandemic. And without going into all the details there, you can read the details, but it's an instance of design methods can be so powerful in addressing problems more than what we've done in the past. And we want to make sure that we're actually teaching those kinds of methods in that way as well in, in uh, education, in, in, in universities and design schools as well. So there's a whole lot more to it than that. And if you go to you know, the, uh, the website that I mentioned earlier, the future of design education.org, you can see all the kind of attributes that we're really addressing, but it's ones like that. Yeah, let, let, let's let's talk about something more specific in a sense about about the challenges that educators are having right now. Yep, uh, that, that are having to teach mostly re remotely. Uh, what what are your views on that? Yeah, it's interesting. The um, we had an interesting insight. the 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 project that I just talked about. Uh, one of the topics was how do we actually make remote education better um, because of the pandemic. And we had some educators that are part of it uh, and some design uh, 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 deans uh, even. And um, there was an observation of one of the members of one of those groups that said, you know, his, his kids were, his, his like uh, um, university aged uh, uh, children were at home, um, now no longer at the university and they were doing their work. And he was like, you know, We've been assuming that students could just sit bums in seats and you know uh, deliver lectures and all that kind of thing. Uh, that that's cool. That's that's sort of the standard uh, way of doing things. He said, you know, he was noticing that his um, his sons were distracted um, when all that the education they were getting were, were recorded videos of lectures, for example. And he was saying, you know, we got to improve this. This is, this is, we've got to make the engagement more effective, got to make the education more effective, you know, as well. So they started down this path of doing that. They actually built a prototype in WhatsApp uh, that I believe is actually being used in India today to, to, to do more bite-sized sort of instruction uh, that isn't just you know, video, watching somebody, you know, talk, uh, for example, right? Um, so that's one angle to it. The other one is, is that is actually getting more, especially in courses that have to do with things like project based, you know, courses, uh, where you're needing to work in groups and the like. Mm. Um, there's a, there are some things that are negative, but there are also some things that are positive in the sense that now you can have, I was just talking to somebody that, that the CEO of a, one of the boot camp companies, uh, uh, and um, he used to be limited to geography. He used to be limited to um, 
having just students that could get to his physical facility, right, his, his campus. And he said, now, he says, education, is, his business has just boomed because anybody anywhere in the, in the world could actually be part of these, you know, as well. And so um, there's a benefit of having way more diverse uh, groups of students now uh, working and also having to give a lot of thought to how do you do some of these things remotely that, uh, and a lot of the time we haven't thought about it. And I, and I don't for a moment criticize faculty because they've, they've, this has been a hard task <laughs> to pivot all the courses to to being online. But I think we've been at it long enough now that there's also an opportunity to use our design skills to make sure that we're actually designing an even more effective and engaging and educational experience for, for our students. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's perfect, that you could do it perfectly. I'm just saying that there are some benefits uh, to doing it remotely that you can counter uh, the negatives uh, of do, working this way as well. well there, there are definitely some advantages. Um, in terms of though creating uh, an environment, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that is what the colleagues are expressing. That is, is very hard to achieve. And of course, in what you all made, mentioned, the attention span of right. uh, younger students tends to be shorter and shorter and shorter. It's not that the lectures are boring because there are no lectures, it's studio environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's that energy of, of a group of people. It's like what you mentioned with, with IBM is like, you must be facing challenges with your designers yes. working in isolation because designers don't, as you said, don't work in isolation. Right, right. And, and that's really where they, well, a couple of thoughts. One is that I think if we really empathize and really understand and do the user research for, for you know, where our, our designers are at, whether they're, it's in education or in, in, in studios or you know, now remote. Um, one of the things we did at IBM, it was actually our, our uh, corporate design uh, group that came up with a, basically a pledge, uh, a working from home pledge. And, it, um, and everybody, it turned out that, that our new CEO, uh, uh, actually shared it on, on LinkedIn as well and encouraged everybody to take this pledge, which was largely one of, of a lot of empathy, basically, for the way that people are living, right? And uh, things like, for example, um, be, being able to be non-camera ready, right? Um, that some of the time, you know, if you've got kids running around or you're whatever, uh, you don't want to necessarily have to turn the camera on. It's more effective if you turn the camera on, but there are moments that you you're, you're not going to be that way. I think the other thing is that um, you think about when you think about it as a design problem, uh, and this is one that an experiment that I'm doing right now, actually. That when I when I ask the uh, the designers in our studios that are now working remotely, I said, "What what do you miss the most? Right? Um, and what's the biggest problem?" So so the biggest problem is being on nonstop uh, video. Uh, calls, right? Uh, so we use WebEx uh, at IBM and being nonstop web WebEx calls, barely getting a break before, you know, the next call. And so what do we do about that? And that's what I do for all of my calls. I, I either have 20 minute, 40 minute, 50 minute, you know, calls, um, meaning and, and not, no, virtually nothing longer than that. Uh, but it's also then um, nobody books a meeting. If it's a 50 minute meeting, there's nobody's going to book, book a meeting for 10 minutes, right? So you always have those, the, the, the downtime between uh, uh, the, the, the calls. So that, so that using that kind of a practice or I know other companies have also done, you know, no uh, video calls between, um, you know, 11 and two, let's say during the day could do the same thing with classes, right? Um, so a way of recharging, a way of like not constantly having to be on, right? And then the other one that people talk about are the, the lack of serendipitous conversation, conversation right? Um, and we've done some uh, experiments on uh, basically using um, uh, ambient audio, Right, so uh, you either just stay on video and audio, but video is big. Uh, but it's more of the, you know, using what 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 uh, gamers use, right? That they're they're constantly on and can chat with one another while they're playing uh, their games and the, and the like, using that kind of format where you'd say, you know, hey, Left Harris, you mentioned that movie that you went to last week. What was that again? You know, it's non-work or some of the time it's work related, but it's that kind of thing. And so, but I don't see enough people being creative at think first of all understanding you know what the biggest challenges are 
this is both in academia and, and I've got two sons at home here that are that are uh, experiencing uh, this from a student's point of view. And um, one is in engineering and uh, the the experience that he's having is that nothing seems to have changed. The, 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 uh, the lecture schedule, the, the, the lab, uh, 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 everything is still expected to be exactly the same and they're just flat out all day, you know? No, no changes were made to, to adjust for the fact that we're doing this thing from home. And so, so the, my major advice is to, especially for design educators, is to use your own methods, <laughs> you know, really empathize with that, with, with the student, you know, yourself. I think, I think also administration needs to take this more seriously rather than saying, you just got to keep doing everything you did before. No, realize that we're in a different world right now. So maybe relax stuff. I mean, I know here locally, they've just extended the, 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 the winter break, the, the, uh, the Christmas break, you know, by a week or two, you know, uh, that'll help. You know, but anyway, that, that, that's, that's, I, my advice in almost every situation is to, especially for designers and design educators is to use design <laughs> to, uh, to, to design the experience for the students and, and as well as for yourselves, because you're going to burn out if you're constantly working, you know, this way. And so, and same with academic uh, with, uh, administrators, I think they also have to realize that their, their staff, their faculty also be more empathetic with what they're going through as well. Interesting. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Find me at uh, carlvredenberg.com. So K-A-R-E-L-V-R-E-D-E-N-B-U-R-G.com is where most of my things uh, are. Um, so I blog there every once in a while. I also have the, um, uh, I've got a podcast uh, as, uh, there as well uh, called Life Habits uh, Mentoring. Uh, that I don't do as frequently anymore as 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 you're doing this one, and then congrats on <laughs> the frequency that you're doing uh, this one. Uh, and you can also just find me uh, first name last name on LinkedIn. Uh, I love being connected with people there too, and so feel feel free to reach out there. Fantastic. And what advice would you like to leave us with? I think that I like to think about the period that we're in right now with regard to uh, COVID. That. My sense is I'm a very positive person and I actually really like the opportunity and, and in thinking about, do we wanna go back to normal? I, I don't think that normal was all that great uh, uh, for the world, uh, where the world was going, you know, the inequities, all, all, there were lots of things that were problematic in the world. And I like to think that we have an opportunity to design a better world. And I think that that's also the responsibility of designers <clears throat> and design educators to help facilitate that. Let's think about what might be the best blend of a hybrid experience when you're teaching, for example, when, when you can go back to, to the classroom. <clears throat> Some of it maybe is appropriate to do using you know, uh, remote uh, education. Think about it. What might be the best for doing that way? What might be best for doing in, in the classroom? That's certainly how we're doing our studios, for example. The expectation is that we're never going to be, I think, fully, fully, fully back um, uh, full time all the time. I think we're going to end up having more of a hybrid uh, sort of model. and We have to uh, do the right technology to be able to make, make that optimal. Um, but I just think that in general, there's a there's an opportunity to make sure the world is going to be a better place. <clears throat> I mentioned the COVID-19 design challenge that we did. We're just about to, in the new year, again, together with the World Design Organization and with Design for America uh, and IBM, <clears throat> we're going to be launching another uh, design challenge. And this time it's going to be focusing on things like the um, climate change. What can we do as designers uh, to, to help address that? How do we prevent, prevent the next uh, pandemic? How do we how do we get rid of uh, and minimize the divisiveness uh, uh, and inequity that we've got in the world? I, there are things that are big challenges that all of us sort of feel, hmm, it'd be really nice if we could actually have some uh, improvement to that. Well, hey, let's use our profession our, and our design skills to be able to do what we can to make this a better world. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much uh, for coming. Thank you. I hope to get to this conversation. Uh, Thank you. Thanks so much, girl. Thank you. Thanks so much, Terrence.